for the last, uh, uh, three, last two weeks, we've started a series, and this series is called You Do Not Have What It Takes. You do not have what it takes. It kind of puts us, wakes us up to uh, some of the things that God, some truths about our lives. There's four different series, four different weeks in this, and we're in the third week. The first week was this one is this, you are not good enough. And by the way, church, that is okay. You are not good enough to meet all the demands that God has right now because you are a sinful person. You and I both are, all of us. And God knows this. And that's why Jesus Christ was sent. Jesus is the only one who's good enough to meet God's holy standards. We cannot keep the Ten Commandments all the way across to sustain ourselves because we've all broken them. And so we're not good enough. And the devil uses that to beat us down. But God says, don't be beaten down. Rely on me. Rely on me. And relying on God, he makes us. And relying on Jesus Christ through these two things. Number one, faith and repentance. We are made right through Jesus Christ. Through faith and repentance. Those two things right there, without them, we do not have the goodness of God on our lives. The second thing that we learn, first of all, we're not good enough. The second thing we learn is through uh, Pastor Chad, it's that we cannot please everyone. So many of us right now, we're obsessed with making, pleasing everybody, making them happy. You know what I'm saying? And there's a quote that he gave in there, and that was this. When we become so obsessed with pleasing people that we, uh, let me read it, we become Becoming obsessed about what people think of us is the fastest way to forget what God thinks of us. We should be concerned about, Lord, what is it? We want to please you. Because if we start pleasing everything else, that Bible says that's like taking idolatry. That's putting an idol up in front of God, and that's not what we're called to do. So we're not called to please everyone. Hallelujah. You know, just, just your pastor. Amen? All right. That, that's not true. Strike that. And today... If you would turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, we're going to be studying. Today, we're going to learn the third truth. And the third truth is this. You can't handle it all. You cannot handle it all. You weren't designed to. The reality is many of us are trying, trying to do way more than we probably should. We're just so busy, so overwhelmed in the things of life and so hurried and so rushed and God says, look, look, I didn't call you to be that way. How many of you are in such a rush that slow people annoy you? Yeah. Slow people annoy you. Well, check this out. Uh, how many of you are the type of people that when you're in the grocery line, you're analyzing which line is moving the fastest, and that's the one you go to? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> I'll tell you how sick I am. There's a, when we go to my house, there's this road that goes this way, and then it, it tees, it goes off this way. But then there's this little, like, little shortcut that goes this way, and that's called Zebra Lane. Well, I'm always taking that road on Zebra Lane to go to my house. And actually, if, once you turn right there, my house is just right there. So as I'm coming up this way, I'm behind some cars that are just, I don't know what it is. I think they're pedaling with their feet, and they're going so slow that it's like, ah, I can't, I can't pass them. I'm in a school zone, and I can't do this. And so they go down Zebra Lane. So what do I do? I go right down 14, and I try to cut across just to beat them. And I always do. <laughs> and here's the sick thing. And all of a sudden, I realize I beat them, but now i got to go past them, and they're going to see me turn 100 yards <laughs> off right there. And so I'm embarrassed as I'm going past them. They're like, mm. So as I'm going past them, I turn up. That's sick. That's, that's wrong. We're so hurried. We're just looking to do things in a very fast way. Uh, how many of you guys have this mock race with your kids? Come on, kids. Hurry up. Let's get your bath. Get upstairs and get to bed right away. Come on, let's go. Let's see if we can do it the fastest. Go. Yeah, all the parents, they, we've done that many a times. We are rushed. Why? Why? Because we're so rushed. I want to show you a picture of what our lives kind of looks like through this video. So go ahead and watch this video real quick. Shell is what they call me. Oh, yeah. Little assignment. No big deal. I can handle it. I'll adjust that a little bit. Thank you. Baseball, you want me to back clean up? Oh, yeah. Have you seen me hit? Center field. Watch my wheels. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, out of town trip. Yeah. I think I can do it because I can handle it. I am the gross. Oh, yeah. Let's play some ball. Yeah. Let's go to the game. Oh, yeah. Got to get the girls to dance. 
got the dance back. When am I going to get that done? But I can handle it all, thank you, so I can watch the game from the 95th row. Man, it's getting a little bit harder, but good thing you're to Grosh. You are to Grosh. Adjust that a little bit. Whew, shopping trip? I hate shopping. Sometimes you got to do it. Hang in there. Oh, um, another assignment at work. Well, how do they think I can handle everything? What? But I got to play with my daughter sometime. Stuff that. Up. I know God won't give me more than I can handle. And it just ticks me off sometimes the way people want to take advantage of you, but it's just stay focused. You can do it. You can, oh, great. You want me to come over for dinner? Sure, I'll be there. Dinner? I don't have time for dinner. Could I get a little help over here? I mean, I can do it. I can, don't give up. Focus, focus. You can do it all. God won't give you more than you can handle. Hey, a little help over here would be nice, somebody. Focus. Oh, no. That was not good. Watch it. Oh, no. Oh. We are so, how many of you guys can relate to that right there? You feel like you're on a treadmill the whole time and people just keep piling things on you. Actually, lots of times, check this out. We think people are piling it on us. We pile it on ourselves more than anything. But we are so busy that we are out of it. Let me give you four examples here how what can happen in your life when you are out of it. Four ways. Number one, you are out of shape physically. You're out of shape physically. Why? You're so busy that you do not have time to exercise. That 10 minute a day video for exercising we bought, I don't have time to do it. <laughs> it's still in the box. I think we've only done it once. I'm sorry, I ratted on you too. But anyway, <laughs> we don't have time for it. It just seems, and when you don't have time for that physically, you know, you're not taking care of yourself, you don't eat right. And when you don't eat right, you know, lots of times, we, here's, here's a family meal now. A family meal looks something like this. You're all in the van, got the family there, you're getting ready to go, taking them to the soccer practice field, and you go through the McDonald's drive through and you all eat a Big Mac together. That is a family together meal. A lot of us could totally relate to that. That's not good. It's not good for you physically. The second thing is that we are out of it emotionally. We are out of it emotionally. You know what? We should have a breakdown, but we just don't have time for it. We're just way too busy. And we're just so, you know, we are overwhelmed and we are a mess in a lot of our lives. The third thing, that we are out of touch relationally, relationally. You know, there's people that we love, but that when we spend time with them, we're just not with them anymore, are we? We just, you know, we're there, but yet we're not there. And then we kind of rely on them thinking, oh, they understand the busyness of the season right now. And so we just trust that, number one, they love us so much that they'll let us get through it. And you know what? That... That there is the beginning of the destruction of your life, of your marriage, or of your relationship. We are out of touch relationally. We just don't have time to connect anymore. And the fourth thing today, and I think is probably the most dangerous one of them all, we are out of order spiritually. We are out of order spiritually, and this is what I want to touch on today. We believe in God. We really do. But we just don't have time for him anymore. Did you know that uh, studies have shown, and I, I don't know how this relates to our church, but through, across America, studies have shown that half of the people who go to church, uh, they only come one Sunday out of the month, and that's it, or less. They, it's not, why? Why? It's not because they're mean. It's not because they're evil. It's because they're so busy. It's not that they don't want to. It's just that they are so busy. Busy. They have kids that they have to get through activities. Lots. If you have lots of kids, I don't know how you do it other than you raise up the oldest one and let them raise the rest of them. But lots of us have real small families. But how do you do it with kids with all their activities in the schools? That's one of the things I've always complained about with youth group. You know, the schools, they used to leave Wednesday nights alone. Not anymore. Not anymore. And now we see on Sundays, they're not even immune to the touch of the schools or touch to the sports. Because now that people have constantly gone through the Sundays because of that as well. We have commitments to school. We have sports seasons. We have our yard to take care of. You know what I'm saying? And it's not because we don't love God. It's just that we're so busy. And, and when we do finally have a weekend free, we're so fried, so fizzled, that we, all we want to do is stay home and relax. Amen? And you, you know, hear what I'm saying? That's why we see half the people not consistent in going and being in God's house all the time because they are so busy. And you know what? That meant that uh, we are out of order spiritually because we don't have time to pray. We don't have time for God's word. 
We don't have time maybe to serve in the church. You want to serve in the church? The church could use people in serving and going out to the community. We don't have time for that. Or maybe we don't have time for small groups. We just don't have time. Our lives are a mess. Yet we still say, I can handle it. How many of you guys have ever done, I can handle this. I know I could, I'll, get through, I'll just get through the season and I'll be all right. We think scripture says that God won't give us more than we can handle. God, God is faithful. He will not give me more than I can handle. Did you know that is not in the Bible? It says that God won't give us, we will not be tempted more than what we can handle. It doesn't say that God won't give us more than we handle. Sometimes I think that God will allow us to have more than we can handle. So what do we do? That we cry out to God and we rely on God. We rely on God's people. So the scripture does not say he will not give us more than we can handle. It just says he will not allow us to be tempted than what we can handle. But you know what? We will be, have a lot more things than we can handle. How many of us would honestly say this? Now, just be real honest. How many of you would say, and occasionally, that you just feel so, don't raise your hands yet, but you just feel overwhelmed. You feel so stressed out that there's just not enough time in the day to do the things that God is, or in your family, you just not enough time in the day to do the things that you know you're supposed to do. Or you look, you just have too much to do. You just feel overwhelmed and stressed. How many of you guys feel that way occasionally? Raise your hand really high. Raise them really high. Keep them up. Look around. Look around. You're not alone. <laughs> Todd. <laughs> Look around. You know, we're not, you know, this isn't right. This, this is wrong. Do you think this is what Jesus wants for our lives? He wants us so overwhelmed, so overstressed, so overworked, so busy, so hurried, that we are so thin, and our lives are just so messed up, and our relationships are breaking apart. All these things, this is not what God wants for us. What the culture says is normal, God says is insane. I gotta be honest, I fall trapped to this. I remember, okay, how, how naked should you bury yourself here, Terry? Okay, I, 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 we wanna go this far. Anyway, I'll just show you how you know, stupid and childish I am. I, I look at my calendars, I, I used to. Now I don't, I hate this. <laughs> I look at my calendar and I'm thinking, and I look back and go, wow, look how full that was. We were really busy then, that's pretty cool. And I just keep looking at the, all the calendar dates and as I, on my iPad as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking how full it is. And we look at the calendar here on the wall and thinking, wow, look how busy. Man, this church has really got things going. You know what? That's sick. It's not about busyness doesn't make you holy. Busyness doesn't make you important. Busyness just makes you sick. You see what I'm saying? And it does. And it just drains our lives and it drains everything about us, even with our relationships with everyone else. So being like that, God says, that's not good. It's not good. Do you really think God wants that? No. What our culture calls normal, God calls insane. It's unbiblical. It's dangerous. It's wrong. And it's probably even right down sinful, being that busy in our lives. Amen? Now, okay. Now, in saying all this, some of us are going to really gravitate. We're going to take this home, and it's going to change us. But I have a feeling the majority of us are just going to kind of let it just brush past and then when we go home, we're going to get right back into our routine, maybe after a couple of weeks. You know what I'm saying? I've been there. I've been there. But I pray right now today that God would speak to our hearts and that there would be a radical change in our lives, that we make some difference because God wants to do something in our lives. A lot of people today would say, I would love to be on the missions field, but they're, they're so in debt that they have to work the extra jobs just to pay off the credit cards that they can never, ever go out on the missions field. And yet that's their heart's desire and what, that's what God put in their lives. And Satan just overwhelmed us with these things and just tried to make us so busy that boom, we lost our calling, so to speak. You see what I'm saying? That's how clever the devil is. So we wanna make sure, we wanna check those things out. I wanna look at a scripture here and the scripture comes from Matthew 11, verse 28. And this is for those of us that feel burdened, feel weary, feel stressed, feel overwhelmed says this, then Jesus said, come to me. Will you say those three words? Ready? One, two, three. Come to me. Jesus is saying, come to me. All of you who are weary, all of you who are burdened, those who are worn out, those who are stressed, those who are fatigued, those who have too much to do, all of you are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. You know, some of us don't even know what that word rest means. 
Sometimes when we do rest, we, we feel guilty because we're not doing something productive. You know, how many of you guys ever know those why, I'm sorry, those people like that? They just, they just were so, they just, if I'm, if I'm resting, there's something wrong. It shouldn't be. If I'm not productive, then there's something wrong. They're just so busy. You know what I'm saying? They just have to fill their time. They just don't know how to rest. Maybe that's you. It's okay to rest. I'm one of those. <laughs> it's okay to rest. I, and I say to my wife, and she's busy, hey, it's okay to rest. <laughs> but nothing gets done in the house, Terry. So therefore, there's got to be a balance in there somewhere. I'm real, I, I just want you to know that. I want you to know that. But Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So rest is not bad. Don't feel guilty when you're resting and you're one of these people who just feels like you've got to be doing something all the time. Don't feel guilty. Bibles, you're not created to be like that all the time. You are created to rest. That's why the Bible gives us uh, the day of Sabbath is to rest and to make it holy for God as well. And that's the fourth commandment. But yet we don't pay any attention to that. We just kind of totally throw that commandment away in the Bible, don't we? It's good to rest. Let's continue in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30. It says this, Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and I will, and you will find rest for your souls. You want rest for your soul? Give it to God. Be yoked to Jesus Christ. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden that I give you is light. So what is a yoke? A yoke is that thing that when you have oxen, usually when you're riding side by side, not riding, but they're plowing usually. But when you have oxen side by side, they would put this either wooden or metal thing that would go around their necks like that so that they would go at the same pace. They would go in the same direction. And when they did this thing, they also have increased strength. This yoke, they made it so that one would have to follow the other. Jesus says that we are to be yoked to him. That our schedule, that our, the way we live our life, the, the time frame, how we do it. Everything about us, God says, I want you, hey, just, you know, sometimes you just need to slow down, be yoked to Jesus Christ and take it easy. Just take it easy. You know, Jesus, he was a busy person. He was very, very busy and very productive, but he wasn't hurried. He wasn't. See, busyness happens outside of us. These are the things we get done, but hurriedness is inside and it's, it's a sickness of the soul. <clears throat> and that type of thing, when we live a life like that, you know what? God says, I didn't call you for that. That's unhealthy. That's unwise for you as well. Not only that, it's not good spiritually. So what is a yoke? That's the thing that joins us together. And Jesus says, be yoked to him. Be yoked to him. My wife has heard me say this many times. You know, we get really busy and every time, but I'm here busy at the church and we'll go into the season. I said, you know what, Jenny? It's just a season. Haven't I said this? It's just a season. Next month, it's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be easier. It's going to have lots of time, and we'll be able to get this stuff done. But I just, I can't do it right now because I got to get this done. It's just, otherwise, it won't get done. And then the very next month, something else pops up, or I fill it with something. Uh, you know, if I can just get through this, just one more season, just this, if I can just get through Christmas, okay, give us one more, couple more weeks, and we will get this play over with, or we'll get this thing, whatever it may be. We're just so busy. You know what? That's, that's, that's a sickness. It's not good. And Jesus says, you know, I want you to just slow down, be yoked to me, and learn to rest, because God says that we are to rest. Amen? How many are grateful for that? Hallelujah. We need to learn the rhythm of Jesus. And the way you learn the rhythm of Jesus is to be yoked to Jesus, to be at his feet, to be praying, and to be listening to all the things that God is saying and speaking to our lives. So there's three things that we need to do. Ready? These are three things that we can apply to our life starting today to help us to come out of this sickness, to help us to come out of this busyness in our life. And I'm ready for it. I got to tell you, <clears throat> in studying this sermon, I, it knocked me out. It kicked my rear end. Because it's just like, my God, sometimes I feel I have to have things worked out in my life before I can preach it. Th does that make sense? I don't have this worked out, church. <laughs> I don't have this worked out. But you know what? Maybe we are called to do things together. Can I do it with you and you do it with me as we work this out in our lives? Amen? Let's just be real. I don't have it together. Maybe you don't have it together. Let's be honest about it and just say, you know what, God? We as a church, we're going to be united in doing this thing. We're all going to be yoked to you, and we're going to do this thing together, and we're going to be healthy and productive for it. Amen? In Jesus' name. So three things we need to do. Number one, <clears throat> some things just need to be shared. Some of your busyness. Some of your work, some of the things that you have to do just needs to be shared with somebody else. You weren't meant to do it all alone. 
You weren't created to do it all alone. Matter of fact, uh, there's a story of Moses when he was overwhelmed and he was overworked. And he was working with all the Israelites as they just came out of Egypt and they're out in the wilderness. And he just felt so overwhelmed that all of a sudden his father-in-law came and was talking to him. And this is what his father-in-law, he's observing all that Moses was doing and how busy he was. And this is what he said. And this is found in Exodus 18, 17 through 18. It says this, Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. It's not good, Moses. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Hallelujah. You cannot handle it alone. Can I say to you today that some of you, some of the things that you're doing, some of the things that you're involved in, that you're overwhelmed with, it is not good. It's not good. Some of the things that's happening in your life, your your busyness, your overwhelmness, it's not good. You weren't meant to do it all by yourself. The Bible says that we are to share some of these things with other people, uh, be willing to help others. How many of you guys are, are the kind of person that says, I'm willing to help anybody? Anyone ask me for a favor? I'm there to do it. But then when it comes time for you to ask a favor or when it comes time for you to need help, that you, you just can't seem to ask anybody to do that? Who's with me on that? What is that? I, I really don't know. Is that a false pride? What is that sort of thing? I could do it on my own. Actually, that's what it is. I can handle this. I can do it on my own. I want to give you an example, uh, and I'm going to, it's a story about my brother Jimmy, and since he's already told people, I think it's okay for me to tell people as well. You're not smiling. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> my brother Jimmy, you know, he, he's a man, he, he just, guys, we have this thing sometimes, we can do things our own. My brother, and he can, I've done this on my own also, but uh, sometimes you just have to ask for help, especially for something that might be a little bit big, but my brother has a real tall house, a two-story house, and uh, he has this real tall ladder, and he's getting up there cleaning out the gutters of the leaves. And uh, his kids are in the house. And I don't know where your wife was. She must have been in the house also. But he's in there cleaning up the leaves. And he's up there scooting along, getting all the leaves out. And he looks up on the roof, and there's a twig. So he, he climbs up there on the roof, <laughs> and he goes after this twig. He finds the twig. He tosses it. And as he does that, he looks up, and he sees the twigs even higher. So he goes up even higher, and he gets these twigs. And then all of a sudden, he's done. He, he turns around. He looks, oh, my goodness. And as he starts to go back, and he turns, all of a sudden, <laughs> You know, you ever get that, like that cat feeling like this, you know, you just hold on like that. As much surface area as you can grab on that thing. And you look up a little bit. Oh, you know, something like that. I've been there. It's like, oh, dear God. And Jimmy kept thinking the whole time, I'm going to fall. I wonder how bad it's going to hurt. I wonder which way, you know, how should I land on my feet? I don't know what hurt. But he's thinking, I'm going to get hurt. So he's up there and he's stuck. And what does he do? He cries out, Matthew. Matthew, come help me. Matthew, get your mom. What is it, Dad? What is it, Dad? Are you going to fall? Can I watch? Huh, Dad? What are you doing? Huh? He says, Matthew, get your sister. <laughs> and he calls up, Jessica, Jessica. Matthew was no help to him. Dad, what is it? Can I watch? The way he tells the story is hilarious. Then he gets, his, he gets his daughter, Jessica, get your mother. So I guess the way the story goes, she comes out and she holds the ladder for him and she kind of directs him and says, all right, now come back a little bit to your right, come back to a little bit to your left. The ladder's you're just going to be right here. Your foot's going to be on it. And so Jimmy's thinking the whole time, I'm going to fall and I'm going to fall on one of my kids or I'm going to fall on my wife. I just, just get out of the way, you know. <laughs> he finally puts his foot on the ladder, finds it. And, you know, how, even once you have that, how ha- awkward it is to climb back over and get the ladder. How many men know what I am talking about, right? Look at all those. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes. That's what happened to him. He didn't ask for help. He didn't come to his big brother. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes we think we can handle it all. You know what? Some things are meant to be shared. If you're busy, you're overwhelmed, you're meant to share it. We're meant to carry each other's burdens. There's a a, a, a scripture for that, but let 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 me put it another way for you. Some of you may be sick, and this has been me. I, I'll get sick. I could pray for anyone who's sick. I don't mind. I love praying for people, laying hands on them, just saying, Lord, I trust you. And I just, it's nothing magical. It's just asking my father. But when I'm sick, I find it very hard to ask for someone to pray for me. I don't do it. That's just stupidity. I can handle this. I don't need to bother my Jesus with it. Amen? See what I'm saying? Don't say amen. That's bad. That's bad. That's wrong. It's just wrong. And so the thing is, you know, God says, hey, give your burden to me. Give it to me. I'll carry it for you. I will help you with it. And sometimes some of you guys, 
You have something in your life. You know, you're not meant to carry that thing alone. Maybe you need to come up to the altar and have someone lay hands on you and pray for you and just release it that way. They'll help carry that burden for you. That's what the church is for. And when we get to that point where we're free and we can trust each other and we can love each other and know that it's not going to go beyond this point, but it's going to be between you and God and they're going to continue to pray for you. They're helping you carry that burden which you were not meant to carry alone. Hallelujah. And when we do that as a church, the world's going to see that and they're going to say, I want to be a part of that family. I want to do those things. I want to be that as well. Amen? So church, don't be stupid like Terry Baldwin and think God doesn't want to hear my issue. God doesn't want to hear my problems. He just wants to hear me pray for other people. Eh, wrong. I can't handle it on my own. You can't handle it on your own either. Uh, Galatians 6.2 says this, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Some things just have to be shared and God's called us to share these things as well. The second thing, that you need to do. The first thing is that is to share. Some things need to be stopped. You just need to stop it. Don't do it anymore. Could you, it could be that you're doing way too much maybe in your life. Well, maybe you need to stop some of those things. Luke 10, there's a story of Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha are sisters, and they have their brother Lazarus, and what they're doing is they're having a dinner at their house, and Jesus is coming. Jesus is friends with them, and as he's coming, Here's Mary and Martha. Uh, Mary sees Jesus, and whatever she's doing at the moment, she just stops. And she goes out, and she sits at Jesus' feet there in the living room or wherever it's at. Just sitting there listening to Jesus, being part of him. What she was doing, she made a choice. She just says, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to listen to Jesus. Whereas Martha, she's in there, and she's getting everything ready. She's cooking Jesus' favorite cookies. She's got the candles lit, lit so the place smells good. She's cleaning the house, making sure it's just perfect because Jesus is there. And she looks out and she sees Mary being a lazy. She says, Mary, get your tail feathers in here right now and help me get some of this stuff done. Help me be productive. You're being lazy. And what does the scripture say? Luke 10, 41 through 42, it says this. And this is Jesus talking. Martha, Martha. <laughs> Just the name alone. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed in order or indeed only one. Let me start that over. He's saying, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Mary made a choice. She made the choice, this is important right here. What's important, this thing over here is better. This thing over here to, is less. I don't need to be doing this in order to be doing what is better. Amen? Sometimes we have to evaluate which is important, which is not important. And some things we're just going to have to say no to from here on out. Finish the statement in your own head. If only I had more time, I would. If only I had more time, I would. Maybe it would be going on a missions trip. Maybe it would be, you know, you spend some time with uh, young kids, uh, big brothers and big sisters, or maybe a part of a coach or something to help out, be a part of other people's lives. Or maybe it's to write a book. Maybe it's to serve in the church. If I had more time, I would do this thing. You know what? There are many, there may be some value that God has put in your heart that you're not doing, that you're not doing because you're way too busy. You have too many things on your plate. There's not enough time. Don't have enough time. I want you to listen to this. When we say, I don't have enough time, listen, that's just a cop out. The truth is, and as a matter of fact, I want to put this saying up there. It says this, you have time for what you choose to have time for. Amen? Amen. Listen, the things that you do, you obviously have time. But you choose to do those things over the things that you wish you could do that you don't have time for. So what we need to do is make a choice like Mary. This is important, and this isn't. I got to stop doing this, and I got to do this. You know what? A lot of you guys have a to-do list, and every single day, things are added to it, and it just gets taller and taller and taller and just gets so big, you know, that it's just overwhelmed. But maybe we need to start a new list. It's the not-do list. Maybe you need to take some of those things off the to-do list and put it on the not-to-do list. Amen? And all the, every man said, amen, how lazy that? Are we, am I just showing you how lazy I am? But anyway, I'm, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> We need to have a not-to-do list. We need to take some things off our plate because some of the things that God has put in your heart that you wish that you could do but you don't have time for, God has put that there. 
A lot of people have not done their dreams or they have dreams when they're young, but they never fulfilled them. Why? Because they've filled their lives with the things that are unimportant and the things that's just nothing but time-consuming mess. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have time for what you want. Our actions communicate what we value. You know, if you value something, you will put your time in it. That is very, very true. Our culture communicates that we value things, that we value money, that we value possessions. How, how do we show that value? How, how do the actions show that? Well, one of the ways is, and, and listen, what I'm getting ready to say is I, I'm not here telling you that what you're doing in your life is wrong. I'm just saying God's speaking to you and that you and I need to make choices. What's, what God's speaking to you, God may not be speaking to me or someone over here, but I want you to know God wants to speak something to you today. You hear, hear this? Our culture communicates that we value things, money, possessions. It's, to, it's totally normal to have two incomes. Two incomes so that you can have a nice house, so that you can have a nice car, so you can have a nice look. You know, we, we do. And that's why we are so consumed with the multiple jobs that we have to have. You know, my wife and I, we've been talking about this, and we've been talking about this for the last several months, you know pulling back on some of her work at, you know, I would love for her to stay home, you know? I love her cooking. It's awesome, <laughs> you know? But the thing is this, we have to figure out in our lives, you know, is this house really important or should we downsize? Have we not been talking about that? Is this thing important or should we just throw that out so that we can do this and so we can be relaxed and, you know, fulfill some of the things that we feel called to do and not only that, get out of debt more quicker. Hallelujah. You may have to do that in your life. It, I'll tell you what it doesn't communicate. When we, when we are, have the two jobs, it communicates that those things are very important, that we have to get those things done or we're in debt. But also, it doesn't communicate that we value family time is important. When we don't spend time with our family, time with our kids, and time together underneath our feet, underneath the same dinner table, it, value, it shows that we don't value that as much as we value the other things in our lives. And it speaks that to every single one in the family. And it's carried on throughout their lives and throughout their adulthood as well. What does sports communicate on Sunday communicate? You know, and here again, uh, I'm going to say some stuff that might be kind of hard, but you know what? It's the truth, you know? There are some people who'll take three months or four months out of the summer and never go to church again because they're so involved with their kids in sports on Sundays and they go through these tournaments all over the place and they're just so tired that, it, you know, what does, that, what does that communicate to the kids? What do those actions communicate to those kids that this sports is more important than God? I'm not saying church is the all thing that, you know, you have to be there to be saved. I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. It does communicate something to our family. And when we are so overwhelmed and so consumed by these things in our lives, it communicates that they are more important than these things that suffer from it. Amen? Hallelujah. Kids are in everything. We need to communicate to them that they are important. We need to communicate to them by spending time with them and being at home with them as well. And how, you know, some of you may say, well, how do I do it all? Well, you don't. You don't do it all. You're going to have to say, you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to stop some of the things that you're doing in order to do what God has called you to do. Let me read to you Psalms 46.10. It says this. Ready? Be still and know that I am God. Some of you are very uncomfortable right now because it's so awkward. We don't know how to be still. We, we don't value stillness. But the only way to really know God and experience God and all his fullness and his, and his power and his glory and his love and, and the things he's doing in our lives, the only way to experience that is to be still in his presence. Amen? I'm not just talking about laying in bed sleeping. <laughs> I'm talking about be still and know that God is God. Spend some time with him. Your actions speak what you and I value. Reason why uh, some of us have never experienced a fresh wind of God or in a long time or experienced the presence or the power of God is because we just do not have enough time for him. That's the reason why. You want to experience that? Then spend some time with God. I promise you will come. Because you know what? The Bible says he wants to. He wants to. So hallelujah. The Hebrew word for still and be still and know, the Hebrew word for that is rafa, which means 
to slacken, to allow to sink, to let go. Well, in today's modern translation, it means drop it. Be still. Drop it. Drop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. Be in the presence of God. Take some time. It's okay to be still. The devil will come to you saying you're not being productive, you're being lazy, you're being this and that. You know, there are seasons that you have to just be still. And God's called us to that. And the devil would just love to fill us, fill our time with things that don't matter so that we miss the things that are good and waste them on the things that are less important. Amen? Hallelujah. We don't have to do it. So some things we need to be shared. Some things need to be stopped. And the third thing that we need to do in our lives, everything needs to be surrendered to God. Psalm 62.1 says this, my soul finds rest in God alone. My soul finds rest in God alone. It doesn't find rest in swimming pools. It doesn't find rest in the vacations. It doesn't find rest in the new home, the new car that has a new butt seat warmer and makes you feel really good. That, it doesn't find, that's not where you find your rest. Your soul finds rest in God alone. Are you sick and hearing you're weary and you're overwhelmed and burdened? You will find rest in God alone, not the things of this world. Amen? And 55, Psalms 55, 22 says, and also after that it says, my salvation comes from him. In Psalms 55, 22 it says this, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. Cast, it actually means cast your cares upon the Lord. I'm going to, uh, Greg, uh, Craig Groeschel gave this story, and I'm, it's a silly story. I'm going to tell you that ahead of time so you'll know it's silly. There's a guy, uh, he has a sack of potatoes on his shoulder, and he's walking down the road, and it's a heavy sack of potatoes. And as he's walking down the road, this, this man drives by in a truck. He says, hey, buddy, why don't you just hop in the back of the truck with that, and then I'll, I'll just take you where you're going. And he goes, ah, oh, thank you so much. So the guy hops up in the back of the truck, still holding on to the sack of potatoes on his shoulder and driving down the road. Well, about halfway through their trip, the guy looks up in the mirror and looks back there and he sees him. He goes, hey, what are you doing holding this? Why don't you just set that there right there, you know, just lay it down. You don't have to carry that. He goes, oh, no, no, you, you've been so kind to pick me up and carry me that I, I don't want you to have to carry my potatoes too. Isn't that silly? See, we go to God. We say, God, I need you for salvation. I need you for my life that I can, that I can be with you for eternity. But then when it comes to our burdens and when it comes to, uh, you know, Casting our cares on the Lord, we say, oh, no, God, I'll carry my potatoes. I'll carry my potatoes. You don't need to carry them for me. I'll take care of these things right here. I can handle it on my own. I can do it on my own. See that? That's crazy, isn't it? God says to cast them on him, to throw them at his feet, and he will help you, and he will carry those for you. And they'll give your soul rest as well. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, in closing, and if I can have the band come up, huh, I just want to ask you guys some very serious questions. I'm going to wait to up so that you can hear these serious questions and, and, and apply them to your life. Remember, you cannot handle it yourself. You weren't meant to. You weren't designed to. Now, in closing, I want to ask you guys a, a very serious question, and it goes like this. What radical change do you need to do in your life right now? What radical change do you need to do to make a difference? You say, well, Pastor Terry, I don't have to do a radical change. I can, I can just do a small change. No, no, no. You are too smart for that. You are. Because you would have figured out something that was easy or real simple to do a long time ago. You would have tweaked it a long time ago to fix the thing that's wrong. So that doesn't work. So obviously, we have to do a radical thing in our life to make a difference. So what radical thing that God is speaking to you? Now, whatever radical thing may be for you will not be the same radical thing that's for you because God's speaking to us individually and separately. Same thing, sorry. <laughs> the Thars Thars is Terry Baldwin there. But what, what radical thing do you and I have to do to make a change, to make a difference in our lives? Amen? God wants to speak that to you today. You may have to make something that's very radical, very different. You know what? God says to cast all your cares upon Him. And the thing is this, we need to do things God's way, not our way. Because if we continue to do it our way, it will never change. It will never change. What radical change do you need to do? Do you need to maybe, okay, like I said, my wife and I have been talking. Do we need a different home? Do you need to get rid of the car? Well, I, you know, I'm not just saying these things aren't the, always the issue, but lots of times they are. We put all of our energy and time into these things. Maybe 
maybe you need to put your hobby on hold for three years so that you can spend time with your children because they're going to grow up without you and not know what it's like to have a mom or dad at home, whatever it is. They're going to be raised by TV and the DVD player. That's not what God wants. That's not what they need. And our actions speak what is valuable to us. So what radical things do we need to do? Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary. Come to me and I will give you rest. So we're going to have to do some radical things. God says, I want to make a difference in your life. So you're going to have to do some radical things. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pray. I want to skip that part there. So I, I want to pray for you right now. So if you bow your heads and I want you guys to seriously just, you know, your heart is still right now. And God's going to speak to you. And we're going to have a, a prayer team that's going to come up here. And we're going to have a chance to respond to what God is speaking in your life right now. You know what? And when God speaks into your life, guys, that's awesome. That's a good, good thing. He loves you. You may feel condemned. Well, you know, that's not condemned. That's conviction. But there's some things that God says, I want you to do this so that you can be all that I've created you to be. So that you can be healthy. So I can restore what the enemy has stolen from you through busyness, through things that don't matter, things you put your life into that just don't seem to matter at all. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, like I said, I, I, I thank you so much that you spoke to me. And Lord, you're still speaking to me through it. Holy Spirit, please speak to our heart and our lives, to those things in our lives that you know specifically that you want us to make a radical change. We don't want a, a fake religion that we just come to Sunday and we think everything is okay. That is, that is a false religion. The religion you want is those who come after you and surrender their whole hearts and their whole lives to you. And there's a difference in our lives. There's a difference in the way we live. There's a difference in the way we talk. There's a difference in the way we act. There's a difference in the things that we value. There's a difference in the things that we set priorities on. There is a difference because God, you come to make a difference in our lives because you love us and you don't want to leave us in the sick condition of our soul that we are in right now. So God, I thank you so much that you know every single thing in our lives and you know that you're speaking to that person right now to every one of us every one of you right now God is speaking to you and just say Lord I, I'm listening I'm listening and that, that you will make a change that you will make a difference don't don't throw this sermon away because God is speaking to you hallelujah Lord hallelujah in Jesus name with no one looking around there might be someone here today you just say you know what Pastor Terry God spoke to me through that message and I need to make a radical change. Can I see by a raise of hands in your eyes? There you go. That is, that is awesome. That is awesome. Praise God. Praise God. So let's make a difference right now. Let's come to Jesus and say, we need a Jesus moment. We need a Jesus encounter right now. Amen.